know, I talked to a couple of my girlfriends who came out with their stories, and they're like, you're going to feel better after. I don't know that I'm there yet. Um, I'm still a little, uh, um, I think I'm still working my way through that. I think, honestly, um, this morning, you know, I went to bed last night. I was a little nervous knowing, you know, I think it's like maybe getting ready for a ball game or getting ready for, you know, a, a match or a big, a big day um, or whatever you do, you know, if you're getting ready for a big game or something, you're, you're, you're nervous and anticipation. And, and then it came and, you know, you get the story out and then sort of the barrage starts happening. My phone started ringing. I started getting emails. My friends started hearing the story and started appearing on places, you know, we started <laughs> showing up on CNN on the, on our monitors and, um, you know, it's, uh, a little overwhelming maybe, you know, at the same time is, uh, um, overwhelming is a good word, I guess, maybe. You know, I don't know. It, I'm not, I thought about it for so long, you know, you, th you think you know what you're going to feel, you know, maybe I'm like, oh, I, when I, when I come out and tell the world, maybe I'm going to be happy about it or I'm going to be like, yeah, I'm going to put it to them or whatever. And, you know, it's not, it's not even that feeling, you know, it's not, it's not like I'm happy about it. You know, it's not like, yeah, he's going to get what he deserves or anything. I mean, it's not, it's not even like that at all. You know, it's just a, um, um, I, don't know, I, don't, I don't even know. Like I said, I think I'm still working through the, the emotion of it all. You know, it's, um, it's still, uh, I still have a pit in my stomach, you know, I still kind of have that, I don't, I don't know whether to cry, <laughs> you know, I don't know whether, I, you know, I think I need a hug, you know, you know? I think I need a, uh, a moment to myself, you know, I don't know, it's just a, uh, um, yeah, uh, you know, um, I think everybody that, uh, everybody, you know, that's in, in, a, in the entertainment business or anybody in Hollywood or what have you have a, they have something that they like to put their time and their efforts into, right, or, um, mine just happens to be, um, uh, I like to support the troops. You know, my father served in Vietnam. My husband's uh, in the Air Force. He's a pilot. And uh, my dad was in Vietnam when he was a young man. He was a, a teenager when he got the draft notice. And he had a, a USO tour um, with Bob Hope and Raquel Welch when he was in, in Vietnam. And so I heard the story, you know, when I was a young girl. And I always thought, wow, that's really cool. So, uh, when I first came up in the entertainment business and um, I was first asked if I would like to go do a USO tour, I thought, oh man, that'd be really cool, you know, and sort of pick up that mantle and be like, maybe I could be somebody's Raquel Welch, you know. And so I started doing USO tours and, and visiting wounded warriors and, and doing all of that. And of course, that co sort of corresponded with, um, you know, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. and. Um, I started doing that, and, and so by the time 2006 came around, um, I was on my ninth USO tour, so uh, eight tours going into the Middle East, and this particular tour, we were traveling with the Sergeant Major of the Army and the USO, and, uh, excuse me, I'll get some water, and, uh, Alf Rankin was on our tour, and then we had some uh, country music artists and a couple of Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders. And kind of a, it's like a variety show. And because I, you know, I don't sing or dance, I'm a host. So I MC the shows and you sort of introduce all the, the acts. Um, I go out there and I talk about my experiences and why I'm there and, you know, and my past tours and why I'm thankful and, my dad had, you know, a USO show, and um, that particular year, since there was Al Franken too, and he doesn't sing or dance, uh, he sort of co-emceed co the show, but 
because he was an, a comedian and actor and a writer, and people knew him from SNL, he came and wrote some skits, and he would do skits in between some of the acts. And um, I'd never met him before, but uh, he had come. You know, we all knew who we were going on tour with beforehand, let's say that. So I had never met him before. We met up in D.C. To, to travel over for this tour. He had written a script, um, a little skit, I guess, if you will, uh, with me in mind. And so when we uh, met up, I've written a little script. If you, if you want to do it with me, we can, you know, you want to play along. So I was like, yeah, sure, okay, that's fine. And uh, so when I finally got the script a couple of days into it, you know, it was, it was a typical, you know, if you think about it, our military is comprised mostly of young, very young, um, early 20s males. Uh, and he wrote this very, um, you know, tongue-in-cheek, very, uh, it's full of sexual innuendos, you know, um, you know, probably a two minute long skit. I don't even remember all those details. It's just, you can see some of it, you can find some video online. You know, everything was very, very tongue in cheek, very, every, you know, I'd say a line and he'd say a line and it was all, you know, mm -hmm, double entendres and stuff like that. And there was a scene where he would kiss me, but of course, you know, I mean, in his mind, I'm sure he was going to kiss me. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, he's never going to kiss me. Um, and uh, so that was that. Well, before we got to the first uh, show, because a couple of days in country, you just meet people. And then we, we had the first show in Kuwait is where we were for the first show. Um, we had a little backstage area. And they had it sort of cordoned off. And... Um, we were backstage alone because he's like, okay, we're going to get ready. And then they sort of introduce us. We come through a, a little backstage door and then we um, open up into the crowd on the stage. And the backstage area is actually part of the gym because that's just sort of how these makeshift places are on these bases. So this little gym, we had this one little corner, kind of like this with these little curtains and they just sort of cordoned off this little area. So it was just me and Al backstage and he had his little props for the rest of his show, um, for the rest of his little skits by himself. And uh, he's like, well, we need to practice the kissing scene. And I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. And I just sort of blew him off because I didn't, like, we don't need to practice the kissing scene. It's just a quick little thing, you know. And then he persisted and he's like, no, we really need to practice the kissing scene. And okay, Al, you just turn your head right. I'll turn my head right. We got this, you know, whatever. And he kept persisting, and I'm like, Al, oh, this isn't SNL. We, we're not really going to kiss, so we don't really have to practice. And he just kept persisting, and it just reminded me of like the Harvey Weinstein tape that you heard the girl when she was wired up for the New York, um, the NYPD, and he just persistent and badgering and just relentless, you know. And so I was just like, okay, fine, just so he would shut up, you know. And he just sort of came at me, and he, we did the line, and. He came out at me, and before you even know it, I mean, you kind of get close, and he just put his hand on the back of my head, and he mashed his face against it. I mean, it happened so fast, and he just mashed his, his lips against my face, and he stuck his tongue in my mouth so fast. And all I can remember is that his lips were really wet, and it was slimy. And in my mind, I called him fish lips the rest of the trip, because that's just what it reminded me of. I don't know why. And he stuck his tongue down my my mouth and I remember I pushed him off with my hands and I just remember I almost punched him so because every time I see him now like my hands clench in the fist and I'm sure that's probably why and I said if you ever do that to me again I'm not going to be so nice about it the second time and I just walked out away from him and I, and I walked out and I just wanted to find a bathroom and I just wanted to rinse my mouth out because I was just disgusted you know it was just one of those um I don't know, I, I was violated. I just felt like, you know, you betrayed my trust and it, obviously that is not what I wanted. And that's, I felt like he wrote that just to get that piece in because he knew he wasn't gonna get it on stage. And that was, that was why he was badgering me to do it then when we were alone because that's what he wanted. And then, you know, five minutes later, we had to go out on stage. And I always joke, I'm, I've always been, I, I've never been an actress. So people always think when you're in Hollywood, I was a model and then I was a television host. And, and 
people are like, oh, you're an actress. I've never been an actress. That's a whole different set of talent, and, and I, I, I don't act. And I had to be an actress. You know, I had to go out on stage with this guy who just did this to me five minutes before and act like he's my best friend and Al Franken, ladies and gentlemen, and this is the greatest thing ever, and do our lines. And, and trust me, he didn't even get close to my face when we had to come in for the kissing scene. And it's, it's funny because when this whole Harvey Weinstein thing came out in the last like two weeks when I was deciding, is this the time I tell my story? And I was just lo looking online and trying to find videos and, to, you know, recalling everything that happened in my mind from, from this time 10 years ago, 11 years ago. And I found a blog of a soldier who was at one of our shows in Afghanistan or, or Iraq. And he, he just took experience at the show just as a, a guy in the audience. And he said, you know, Al Franken and Leanne Tweeden were great co-MCs and Al told a couple of jokes. And then, then Al goes in for a kiss or more from Leanne and fails. And I just thought, yeah, that's exactly what happens. And he failed every time because that's what happens on stage. And you know, I thought as a, it would be, um, the joke would always have been to me, the funny part was, it would have been like Al would have, you know, in my mind, Al would have just come in for a kiss and I would have turned my face or I would have put my hand on his mouth. And that would have been the funny part, right? That would have been like this old guy coming in for the kiss from the hot girl or whatever. You know, the skit would have been to these young troops and it would have been funny because it was comedy, right? Obviously, it turned out completely different, but, you know, so I had to act my way through the rest of the shows for the next two weeks, 10 days, two weeks. Um, and I just made sure I was never alone with him again. I never told, I didn't tell the Sergeant Major of the Army what happened. I didn't tell our USO rep kids, what was I gonna do? Be the troublemaker, be like, okay, I'm gonna MC every part of the show for the hour, except the 10 minutes I'm on stage with Al. You know, I just sucked it up. I'm a strong girl, I'm a sportscaster. So I deal with guys every day. I'm just gonna fake it and act like an actress and do this part with him and then not talk to him for the rest of the, you know, rest of the tour. I mean, it's a, it was a big tour with a lot of people. I just didn't, I didn't socialize with him. I didn't talk to him for the rest of the tour. I made sure I was never alone with him again. I mean, we were in tight quarters, but there were a lot of people around. So I just made sure I was never alone with him again. And uh, so I didn't have to deal with him in that respect again, other than when we were on stage. Uh, and then, you know, little petty things that I had to deal with just, snide comments um, we would do autograph sessions after the shows uh, of course they would set up tables and because there would be sometimes thousands of troops at an event and we would only have so much time so there would be long tables for all the you know the country music artists and the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders who were very popular by the way and then um, instead of like trying to have a single file line of you know a thousand guys trying to come down and get everybody's autograph they would open it up to where you, everybody, if you wanted somebody a certain autograph and there was only time for people to wait in one line, they would just open it up to where people could just stand in the line that they would want instead of filing it through like this. So sometimes there would be, honest to God, nobody in Al Franken's line. So people would line up, the girls would have long lines, some of the country music artist guys would have long lines. So I would always be sat next to Al because that's just how they always set it up. And so I would always sort of have my back to him and whatever, and I'd be sitting next to the other people. And we'd have lines, we would sign autographs, and I mean, it was just hours of signing and taking pictures with troops. And one time he didn't have people in his line, and I would see things out of the corner of my eye, and I'd see, you know, like a hand and a picture, one of my autograph pictures go like this, and, you know, and I would look over one time, and, you know, one time I would just see, and a picture would come back, and it would be, you know, my face would devil horns and the, the the devil tail and the pitchfork and the goatee and you know I mean these are the things I'm dealing with right like he draws me as the devil I'm like okay childish belittling whatever it's just like <laughs> that's uh, two weeks of this is what I'm getting at sorry and uh, so whatever so I make it through the the two weeks of that and then um, we're on our way home we leave, uh, pretty sure it's Bagram Air Base, we're leaving out of Afghanistan. And every time you take off from a, 
um, from a base when you're in the middle of combat. You always wear a Kevlar helmet uh, and, a, and a black vest um, because when you leave from a um, in the middle of a war zone, you do wear your 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 gear because small arms fire or even an RPG like a rocket propelled grenade can can pierce the armor uh, or pierce the the skin of an airplane. And so a lot of times you either sit on Kevlar or you you wear it because you can be shot at through a plane. So you're wearing it as you take off until you get high enough altitude where you're out of that reach and then you can take it off. So I'm wearing it, I fall asleep because I can fall asleep usually before the plane even takes off. So I'm sleeping up against the side of the plane. Um, and in the photo, if you see the photo, beside me is Mark Wills, the country singer. He's also asleep. Um, so I'm sleeping, which anybody that knows me, I sleep anywhere, anytime, so I'm asleep. Uh, and um, there are photographers on the trip, and I'm pretty sure it was probably the photographer of the tour that took the picture, but they give you CDs as you leave that have, you know, behind the scenes photos of you uh, on the entire tour that they give you when you leave. And uh, I get this and I open it up when I get home. Um, I probably opened it the next day. And it was a photo of Al doing his, you know, this on my breast, like looking at the camera, just kind of smirking and smiling, like, hey, look at me. And I took that as the, you know, the final, like, <laughs> like I got the last laugh, um, you know. I mean, he knew I wouldn't see it until, until I got home and, you know, was away from everybody else. And, and uh, you know, like I said, the, the, to know it in the context of the entire trip and what, what happened in the entire two weeks um, is, is, telling to me and, and just the the fact that um, he just thought he could get away with it and that it was okay and that it was funny and you know I knew I knew all these years later that oh well I thought it was gonna be funny you know I thought you know oh the comedian I thought it was gonna be a I thought it was a joke I was in bad taste or I thought it was gonna be funny and I guess it wasn't or you know it was poor taste or whatever I mean nothing like that is ever funny I mean is it funny if, if he does that to your sister or your daughter or your wife I mean that just that's just all of those things but like I said in context of already assaulting me backstage and and every, all the little petty things he was doing to belittle me and 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 how he treated me and sort of you know, in succession, and then it ended with that, and then how I was left to feel like without being able to say whatever I needed to say to his face, that that's how I, you know, I'm like, oh, great, while I was sleeping, you do that to me, and then I can't even say anything to him, so that's just sort of how it all happened and how it finished. So when he, when he says in his statement, I mean, he issued two statements, he says, one, I apologize. Mm -hmm. Two, I respect women. Three, I don't remember the statement. Wait, hold on. So I've only seen the first one. Can you read the second yeah. and third ones uh, to me? Well, he says, I respect women. I don't respect men who don't. The fact that my own actions have given people a good reason to doubt that makes me feel ashamed. Uh, he's also asked for, as has Mitch McConnell, an investigation. So, one, do you accept his apology? And two, what do you think should happen after an investigation? I mean, I, yeah, there's no reason why I shouldn't accept his apology. You know, I mean, if that's, sure. Um, I, I wasn't, um, I didn't come out to, I wasn't looking for anything, you know what I mean? And people are like, well, what, what were you expecting from him? What did you expect from him? If he wanted to apologize, great. It, it, I mean, look, this has happened, this has been going on for, this happened 11 years ago. I saw him a couple of years after that with my husband at a USO gala and he walked up to me and found me in a room and said hello to me and I was very cold to him and I turned around he found me and, and you know with my back to him and said hello and I was like hi Al and I turned around and walked away from him my husband even said to me last night he's like as I recall Leanne you left me standing there with Al because you said hello and then turned and turned your back on him and walked away and left me standing there with him and I'm like yeah because I wasn't going to talk to him you know so <laughs> my husband said hello Al but no he had a chance to apologize to me then because he knew he knew exactly what he did to me then and that picture was out there 
so he had a chance to apologize to me. So I wasn't holding my breath. I'd have been long dead by now, by then, you know. So um, the apology, sure, I accept it. Yes, I mean, pe people make mistakes, and of course he knew he made a mistake. So yes, I do accept that apology. Um, the ethics investigation, if that's what Mitch McConnell wants to do, uh, that's that's on them. I, that, I, I'm not calling for that. If that's what he wants to do, I, okay, that's that's up to them. I, I'm not demanding that. I'm not I'm not demanding any of that. I, I just don't want this. To me, it's more about, um, you know, this is happening in Hollywood. I think we live in a bubble. I live in a bubble. I've worked in the entertainment business, um, sports, radio, television, commercials, movies for over 20 years, and. I think because all of this is happening here, I mean, this has, you know, I mean, with Al now in, in the Senate, so this is um, kind of Hollywood and kind of politics, but it's sort of the same sort of stage, you know, it's just sort of parallel. But um, this is happening in middle America. This is happening, you know, for women that work at Chili's. This is happening for women who work in an office building somewhere in Iowa and Kansas and Florida. I mean, this is happening to women who have, have, you know, no power and no say to speak up. You know what I mean? And this is, um, I think the tide is turning and, and you know, what, what about all the women who don't have microphones and have a voice and can say something and then it's everywhere on the news? You know, what about the women who get assaulted every day and are afraid to speak out? I mean, look, I was afraid to speak out 11 years ago. I wanted to say something and, and there were people around me who said, Oh my God, you will get annihilated and you will never work in this town again. And I was afraid of that. I really was afraid of that. You know, I was working at the Best Damn Sports Show. I was working at Fox Sports. I mean, I, I had a good career and I thought, you know what, if I, if I come out and speak out then, I probably would get fired or would just get phased out. And, and I was afraid of that, you know, and I'm not afraid of that anymore. I mean, could it still happen? Sure, possibly, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a lot more secure and, 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 you know, myself, my career at this age now, and I really do think the tide has turned. And really, I'm doing it now because it's different. There's strength in numbers. Uh, Congresswoman Jackie um, Spear has come out, and she's talking about it now. And when she said she had that experience when she was in her 20s as a congressional aide and came out and said her chief of staff stopped her in an office and, and grabbed her face and kissed her and stuck his tongue in her mouth, and I just, we had her on our air, and she said that to us while we were interviewing her on McIntyre in the Morning, the show that I'm the news anchor on, and I said, I looked at Doug, and I went, I kind of mouthed, I'm like, that was Al Franken to me. And I said, I think that was my catalyst to sort of go, you know, if I'm going to tell my story, now is the time. 2017 is not 2006, you know, it's just a different time, and maybe, maybe, I can be somebody's Jackie Spear and, and they can tell their story in real time and not, not wait and not wait. I mean, why do you think so many people are coming out now that have stories that are decades old? You think you should step down? You know, people make mistakes. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not calling for him to step down. <laughs> you know, I, that's not my place to say that, you know, I mean, if there are other people that come out and say he's done this, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, if I'm the only one that's come out and said Senator Franken's done something to me, but if there are other women that have come out, I, you know, I haven't returned a phone call. I've gotten a phone call from a woman that has, I've only gotten a message and that said that some, uh, something similar has happened to her and I haven't returned it yet. So, um, I'll, that's to be determined, but. You know, I don't know. That's not my call. I, I, I don't, I don't know. But I don't, you know, I'm not saying that. You know, Le Leanne's been here since 3.30 this morning. Um, if we still need a fast one-on-one, -on -one, we can do it standing up there. We can kind of move it along. But I think this was probably maybe more than anyone thought. It. Unbelievable what you've done. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So if we need to do that, let's do it and get going and bring me the mic back. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you for talking. Bring that whole thing. Thank you for talking. Yes. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Yeah, sure. Absolutely. What is it? Jim. Thank you. Yes, of course. Yes, 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 of course. 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 Of course.